So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here in such an early time in the day, and thank you all the GitConf, uh, CommitConf, sorry, uh, all the volunteers and the organizers for, you know, dedicating their time to provide us with this beautiful talk. Uh, my name is uh, Salvador Perez. I, sorry, sorry. Yeah, spelled S A W A N E by Starbucks employees all over the world, which is not exactly the the actual, anyway. Uh, so, yeah, I'm currently working at 20 as a backend engineer, and meanwhile, I'm just yes, uh, studying some functional programming to try to sneak some of the features there. Let's see how that goes. And, well, the important part of this slide is that we are hiring. So, yeah, if you, any of you want to join us, just go just outside the, the, the talk and left hand side we have a stand so you will be able to provide your data and we'll contact you. Uh, this talk is about Git internals and this is the agenda we will, we will have today. First I will do a, just a brief, very, very brief introduction. I will ask you a couple of questions to warm up the, the audience. And uh, I've uh, split the, the talk in three parts. For the first one, I will talk about the low-level uh, data structures that Git manages. After that, I will provide just a bit of uh, data on some extra, I won't call them data structures, but some extra data Git manages. And after that, I will talk about all the high-level commands you can use and how they relate to those uh, data structures, if time allows it, which, well, we'll see about that. Uh, for the introduction, uh, how many of you are using Git in your current work or have you used in, in the past? Okay, yeah, most of you. And uh, from all of you that are using it, how many of you did have to clone uh, a repository again after messing up? Ever? Cool. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Git was built with kind of the Unix philosophy in mind not because of the, the Git, Git itself, the Git CLI itself, but because of the, all the subcommands it contains. So there are lots of very, very low level that only do one thing and they do it well. And then there are lots of abstractions which use the, the low level ones. The first ones are called the plumbing commands and the uh, second ones are uh, the porcelain commands. And that's all for the introduction. Uh, this is the directory that you get once you create a new repository or clone one. Uh, it will create a .git folder directory. And inside that, you will have this structure here. The branches one is, as far as I know, deprecated. And uh, it's only there for purpose of uh, backward compatibility. Uh, hooks and info are important, but not, I will not delve into those. And finally, these three here, I will talk about them, both logs, refs, and objects, but I will focus more on these two. Uh, yeah, I decided to uh, name this part of the, of the talk, just Git as a version file system, because it kind of is what actually happens behind the scenes in, in Git. Git manages three, kind of, three kinds of objects, the blobs, trees, and commits. For the blobs, it is a representation on, on one file at one given point in time. It will contain the whole content of the file, uh, compressed, so it will be really small because it's usually text. And the name of the, of the file is uh, the SHA1 of the content. It, I think it has some more details about that. It contains something about the name for salting and everything, but Basically, it's the, the hash of the, of the content. Uh, notice that the blobs don't contain any information about the name of the file. It's only the content. It's a dump object, just a dumping ground for the, for the object content. So I won't talk much more about, about blobs. Here, I left you a couple of uh, plumbing commands, the low-level ones, in case you want to delve a bit deeper and uh, just play a bit with it. These are, well, the ones used to get one file and generate the, the blob object, and the ones to retrieve one. So 
so you can play with those and uh, we will go yeah we will go into trees uh, when I talk about tree the tree structure that git uses I'm talking about one node of a tree so it recursively uses several trees to to get the whole directory um, it has a very tight structure uh, internal structure because it, uh, this one is not compressed it only contains data and contains yeah pointers to blobs and trees uh, yeah this is a screenshot for one actual uh, tree in one of my uh, repositories as you see it contains in the first column the unix uh, permission tuple with some extra data which is used to identify the the type of object there even when you have the, the, the actual type there. You have here the signature, so the SHA1, with which the object is named after. And finally, here is where uh, Git stores the name of each file and directory, so it can retrieve it later. That's all the recent trees, so when you want to get uh, uh, your whole directory back at one point in time, it will get the top level directory, the top level tree, and recursively all over the different trees it will get the data back. Commits. Commits do uh, have the um, a very tight uh, representation as well because it contains as well data that Git needs to understand and parse. Uh, I think we will see better what it contains in the, in the example here. It starts with a tree, so the representation, the hash of, a, of the tree and the parent commit. So you could say the whole git uh, repository is just a graph and it, in each node of the graph you contain a tree with the whole version you had at that point in time. Because that's what commits are. They are a, a, a snapshot of your whole director of your whole repository in a given point in time. After that you have two lines that at first seem to be actually the same. So the author and the committer but there's a very slight difference. The author is the one who actually wrote the changes in, uh, in reflected in that commit. The committer is the one who actually committed them, which is usually the same, but not always. So for instance, when you do a cherry pick, you basically are copying the diff from you, you introduced in one commit into another. If you do a cherry pick of your own commit, yeah, that's no problem. Both will be still the same. But if you cherry pick a commit from a different user, yeah, the author will keep track of who was the original committer of those, of those changes. And the committer line will uh, contain info on who did that actual commit. So you don't keep uh, traceability on that. Finally, in these lines, you have the um, timestamp on when was that commit created. So that's how uh, several tools uh, let you know how many time ago it was created. That's that's how. And finally, well, you have the the git message for the to identify what happened in the, in that without lo actually looking at the changes it themselves. So yeah, that's basically all there's about commits. And yeah, I kind of uh, lied a bit. Uh, there's one fourth data structure here, not only blobs, trees, and, and commits. We have the index. The index is kind of, I like to see it as a dumping ground for everything. So it contains a lot of information on uh, optimizations. It contains a lot of info on what, for instance, what files you did add, and they are pending to commit. So all that information is here. It has, uh, for what, I can, what I've been able to find, uh, it, contain, it doesn't have a very uh, thorough and in-depth in depth, uh, documentation on the structure. I found these two links, which you can check in the, in the slides, because I added the, the link to the, to, to the slides to the uh, talk description, and I will tweet them as well, so you can, you can just delve deeper as well. And uh, again, I've left you a couple of plumbing commands in case you want to play a, a bit more. But yeah, as I told you, each blob contains the whole contents of a file in a given point in time. 
and trees references those blobs, and commits references those trees, and to do a checkout, you don't need a network to get those files back, right? So do you keep the whole history of all blobs you have created? So every time you do a git add of a file, you're creating the blobs for, that, for those files. So if, even if you uh, add a file by mistake and you revert it back and you make some more changes and you add it again, you will have two blobs. Are you keeping those? Yes. Yes, you are. Except for some optimizations Git does, which, well, I will talk about them in more in depth later, but I can give a, a sneak peek on, on those. So for big files that don't change often, let's think about, um, I don't know, uh, let's assume someone by mistake did add a SQLite database there for testing data. And uh, that database only changes once every month, two months, because of, I don't know, uh, a change in the schema, for instance, or some extra test cases you need to add to the database. So in those cases, Git will be able to uh, recognize these files are a waste of space. So it will create some uh, structure in which it will hold the last version of the file and deltas to the previous ones. So, well, Git is assuming you will uh, want to use the most recent one uh, more often than the, than the old ones, so it's on that way. And of course, you only see one slice at a time. You will only see one version of each file uh, at a given point in time. Uh, I will only go uh, very quick on this. It's not actually an issue, and I, uh, that's obviously marked as a one fix, but this can give you a really uh, big headache when debugging it. We have seen it only once in, in 20. Uh, it was a couple of months ago, I think, and uh, yeah. So it's what happens when uh, two objects you have created, even uh, a tree and a blob, a blob and a blob, commit and blob, whatever, have the same signature because SHA did collide. And uh, there are some funny cases, depending on which object did uh, collide with which one. Uh, I left here uh, a link uh, where one guy did uh, recompile his SHA1 library to, pro to generate a really, really small hash and just by brute forcing it, pro uh, generating uh, collisions. And it's really funny to, to read, so I left it there. But the scary thing is, yeah, this one, that some of the failures are silent and you will only detect them when another person uh, clones or pulls and everything will be a mess. Following from that, I will go into the second part, the building up. Uh, I will talk here about branches, uh, tags, and logs. Logs are not so uh, well known, but branches and tags, I guess, are. Uh, for that part, uh, the, the branches and tags are stored here, so refs heads is branches, and refs tags is, is tags. And finally, uh, the logs contain everything about logs, obviously. Uh, talking about branches, uh, at its core, branches are nothing more than one file containing the hash of one commit. That's all there is to branches, with one catch. If you are uh, checked out, we'll see what that means in a very b brief moment. Uh, if you are checked out into a branch and you create a new commit, the branch will move along, which is a behavior you have already seen, so I didn't... Mm, I didn't discover you, America, but there it is. And this is why uh, Git knows when you are checked out into a branch or why not, or, or when, when not. The head. It's a file uh, contained in the .git directory, just in the plain .git, not inside any subdirectory. And it contains a symbolical reference to uh, the, the last branch you have checked out. So that way, uh, if you checked out master, this will contain master, just the plain word. It's a symbolical reference. It doesn't resolve the, the actual commit. So that's the way Git knows, OK, I have to move the reference master a bit uh, further when you do a new commit. 
but it doesn't always contain a symbolical reference because you can check out uh, single commits. So when you check out a commit, this will contain the most symbolical reference it can get, which is the actual uh, SHA one, which is not exactly a, a symbolical reference anyway. Uh, while going through these slides this morning, I did think, and I've never tried it before, so I give it to you as homework, and I will do it as, as well myself. Uh, what if you have a branch with the same name as one SHA1 from, from a commit, and you check out that commit, it will probably move the, the branch, but yeah, let's, let's see about that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, when it doesn't, it, contain, it does contain the, the, um, the commit, the commit hash, yeah. After that, yeah, I will go outside, I will skip tags for a moment and talk about logs. Logs is a really, really unknown and really, really useful feature in, in Git. And it's because it contains everything that has happened in uh, your repository. Whenever you pull, whenever you fetch, whenever you merge something, whenever you do even a Git add on a file, this is logged here. And if you realize from the, uh, the structure, these refs heads uh, kind of resembles to these refs heads here. And the refs remotes origin uh, references this refs remotes origin here. So exactly, it will split the logs depending on which branch you are checked out at a given point in time. So uh, if you mess up again with your repository, you can come here and see, OK, what did I do that went wrong? And you will see everything. So you can fix it, which is great. You don't have to pull uh, to clone all over again, which is, which is really, really good. And on top of that, uh, Git uses these logs to provide you some extra functionality. I will, if I have time, I will show you uh, nearly the end. After that, yeah, now we have completed our detour for logs. I, I said I was going to go only briefly over them. And I will move to tags, which is not a very exciting uh, topic anyway. Tags are like branches but they don't move. That's all there is to branches, well, with a couple of catches anyway. There are two types of, of tags. The, co the ones called uh, the lightweight tags, in which, yeah, it's only a file containing uh, a, an object uh, SHA1. And notice I didn't say a commit SHA1. You can do tags on, uh, on blobs. You can do tags on trees. Uh, you can do a lot of black magic with that. So, for instance, you can have some objects committed into Git, because if you have a tag pointing to it, uh, Git will upload those objects. But you don't have them in any working directory. So uh, debugging scripts you don't want in the final version of the, of the program, you can have them apart. And you can just get them out with uh, pulling out the tag, or whatever actually you, you want to think about. After that, uh, the annotated ones. Annotated <laughs> tags are resemble more uh, to commits. So uh, the annotated tags contain kind of the same structure as, as a commit. It contains the author. It contains uh, the timestamp. It contains a commit message, which is why they are called annotated, because they have the, the message on what you are pointing to, which kind of helps if you are not pointing to a commit, right? Uh, and yeah, the object type and uh, a reference, obviously, to the object. Uh, now I'll move to uh, the remotes part of it, in which, well, a remote, uh, we know that Git is al uh, always uh, defined as a distributed version control system. So what does this mean? This means that there's not a central repository where it doesn't have to, ha it doesn't have, to have a central repository from where you pull all the changes and you push all the changes and there's nothing more on the sides. So let's take as an example Heroku, the deployment platform. Uh, to be able to deploy uh, into Heroku, you just need to make a push onto the Heroku uh, remote. So in, the, in that case, you would want to have two remotes. You can have origin, which will point to GitHub, Bitbucket, whatever you like. And you push there your, your code. And then after that, once you want to deploy, you just push to the Heroku remote. And you can, in a 
very weird uh, scenario. You can even have a remote pointing to a, a peer uh, repository and it should work. I, I don't have any case in mind why you would want to do that, but yeah, you can. Uh, so yeah, the remotes uh, are configured in the .git slash config and they are configured like this. For each remote, you will have the URL of where the, the, the whole repo is being uh, kept and then a bunch of uh, ref specs. By default, it will only create one. The, I think it's the first one. Well, with an asterisk here anyway, not, not only master and an asterisk here, not only master. But this basically uh, tries to represent the fact that whatever you find in your uh, remote origin, the, the, uh, the remote you called origin, ma uh, the reference master will be pulled into your dev master. So in your local, the branch will not be called master, but it will be called dev slash master. So you can do a lot of things uh, there. The one by default substitutes the dev master by an asterisk only. And uh, if you have the, only the fetch one, the fetch and the push will be uh, symmetrical. But push tag here, which will say, okay, but when I push master, I will push to dev master. For instance, this is a very, very silly example, and this is not from a real repo. I did just make this up for, for the purpose of the, of the talk, but anyway. Also, you may have noticed I have a plus here, and I don't have a plus here. That's a very subtle difference, and uh, what that means in, in Git terminology is that with in the ones with the plus, you are allowing it to pull from that remote into that branch, even if the changes are not fast forwarding. So even if you have to actually merge and solve conflicts, it will pull and it will merge into your local branch. If you don't have the plus, it will not. It will say, oh, this is not a fast forward, I'm not going into there. So that's something you may find useful to to be able to avoid those or losing changes or having merge conflicts when you didn't want to just by pulling. So that's, that's a very useful thing here. And anyway, we are moving finally into the optimizations Git does. I will only talk about a couple of them. So the one that is not in the slides is about uh, the objects directory. So I told you every tree, every object, every commit you have ever they are dumped into the, the uh, object directory. That means that once you have a repo, I don't know, with commits for over five years, you will have really huge amount of, of uh, files there. So once Git notices, oh, this is really big, and uh, searching for a given uh, reference in one of those directories with a lot of files will be really expensive. So it will just make an optimization and what it will effectively do is take in all the, all the uh, hashes, take out the two first characters, and create a directory with that name, only the first two characters, and then moving the whole object inside, removing the first two characters. So effectively, the, the, look, the lookup will be exactly the same, but you will be narrowing the search uh, bit by bit. And if one of those folders directories already contains a huge lot of objects as well, it will apply that again and create more subdirectories with two characters and move the blobs inside. So searching will be much, much faster. Then moving on to packed refs. Uh, references, uh, that's where the name comes from, are, as I told you, uh, branches and tags. That's all there's to, well, and remotes, the remote branches anyway. Um, once a Git notices oh, you have lots of references that you are never changing. Uh, you have tags made in 2005 and we are in 2018 and it's, it's pointing to the same object. So there's no point in keeping that in its, in, in its uh, own file because, again, it slows down the search. It will do the same for, uh, for branches. So what Git will effectively do is creating a file called pack, uh, packref which will be in the .git directory, and it contains uh, a list of uh, hashes 
for uh, yeah hashes of the point the object the branch is referencing the branch or the tag and the name of the tag and it will be ordered by the name of the tag so it will be much much easier to look for one of the references and pull the the reference back the the hash and uh, finally the pack refs uh, sorry the pack files this is what I told you about before uh, the ones containing the last snapshot of an object and deltas to the previous ones git will do this automatically every time you push if I recall correctly and uh, every time you do a git gc so for the ones of you that don't know what gc is when you run git gc uh, git will uh, just sweep over all the objects you have in your in your dot git directory and just check is this object still referenced no i'll delete it when will an object uh, stop being referenced so for instance when you do a git add and then reset it because you didn't want to add that that file that object will be orphaned nothing will point to that object unless you create a tag so those files those blobs will be removed when you do a git gc and these pack files will be created uh, at that point in time as well. So yeah, that's a, a very neat optimization you will have by harnessing the power of Git. And uh, finally, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but anyway, I will go up to the point I can. I will go over uh, some high level commands and uh, I will try to show you how it maps to each of the of the data structures here. So uh, starting by git diff, when you git diff, you just basically get two references. Uh, you unpack all those objects. Uh, so for instance, you get one branch and one commit, for instance. So you are diffing the point in time uh, pointed to that by that branch with the, the the point in time pointed to by that commit or two branches or whatever you want actually. So git will unpack all those references regenerate all the directory structure and just diff file by file. So it will basically show you the diffing of those. Uh, by default, if you just run a git diff, it will run your current status with all the changes you have done, your working directory, with the unpacking of the reference you have in the head. The file we, uh, we talked before about the last branch you committed, you checked out or the last commit you checked out. So it will unpack that and it will compare it with your working directory just by diffing, the normal diffing. After that, we have the git reset hard. If you haven't ever heard about it, git, re, git uh, reset hard just takes uh, your current branch and it moves the tag because we showed the branch is only one, one tag, one reference, it will move it to wherever you point it to. So if you do a git reset hard uh, master, it will move your current branch to master, and that will be all. Well, it will actually unpack whatever is in master because you are moving, you are actually moving and checking out to, to that uh, point in time, but all there is to it is uh, moving the pointer. And uh, you will lose when, when you do a, the reset hard, you will lose all your current changes in the working directory. So not only the changes in the current directory, but the changes from the branch you are uh, now moving to, to the branch you are in now in before running this, all those changes uh, in the middle, they will be ignored and removed. As opposed to that, we have the reset soft. This is the default reset. If you, you don't need to write the dash dash soft, it's just git reset. It will um, basically move again the pointer to the branch you have told him to or moving the, the branch to the commit you have pointed to and it will diff the origin and the destination and let you those changes as an uncommitted changes. So you can, I don't know, I usually for instance when I use this is because I did a lot of WIP commits because I was working on that and at the end of the day I just committed whatever I had and after all that development cycle, I said, this repo is a mess, this branch is a mess. Okay, I will go back by keeping all the changes and I will redo the commits in manageable bits. Or for instance, when you have, God forbid it, a really, really big code review and your code review tool 
doesn't allow you to because oh actually you are trying to get inside 10,000 files and we are uh, limited to 700 so you can go back and say okay I will commit this 700 by 700 and just one code review for each for instance that's not a very common use case and I hope you don't have to do that any uh, anytime but that could be a use for that <laughs> uh, yeah check out when you check out a branch well the first thing it will do is writing your reference into the into the head which makes sense because that's what the head is and then it will unpack the the object so it will uh, the reference by the brand what commit is pointed to by the branch name from that commit it will take the the top level tree it will recreate the object go inside all the, the sub trees and do it again and again and again uh, recursively until you have the whole uh, repo again merge merge is a, a the first interesting command because we have two cases here for the first one uh, well I'll skip that well no not really uh, for the for the git uh, uh, merge what uh, git will effectively do at the at first will be to calculate the first common commit between the two branches the one you are trying to merge and the one you are trying to merge into it will calculate the, the co most common ancestor and there's where the two cases are first one is you are trying to merge a branch that came out from the branch you are trying to pull it, uh, to merge it into so the actually the uh, most common ancestor is the commit you are in right now so that's the first case here uh, in which you are trying to, met, to merge test into master I have a, a typo here sorry about that the green commit is this one and the head is, is here but for the rest of it it's, it's good um, so what git will effectively do is okay what's the common ancestor between this one and this one okay it's this one so what should I do just move the tag and you have committed it you have merged it sorry uh, this behavior is called the uh, fast forwarding and that can be avoided why I say that because uh, in some projects in some uh, companies you prefer to keep traceability on when did you merge and what changes were introduced there if you do this you are just introducing uh, n commits here which you don't know when uh, that, that feature started when did it end it's just there like if you commit it straight into master uh, you can avoid this uh, behavior as I said and create a merge commit here by uh, running the git uh, merge with no ff so that will avoid the, the fast forwarding uh, behavior and it will behave like the second one so we have commit uh, at the tip of one branch which I will call commit A and we are trying to merge it into branch commit B so uh, the most common ancestor is not B but another uh, arbitrary com uh, commit called C which is basically this uh, this um, status here uh, once again sorry about that but the green ones and the, uh, the head should be in, in the master branch which is a shame but yeah so what git will effectively do in this in this case is just basically creating a whole new commit which is called uh, a merge commit and this is actually the reason why uh, the structure that git uses for the top level commit referencing is not a tree but a graph because the commit that gets created has two parents both commits the one you are merging and the one you are merging into are both effectively parents from the commit you are creating the merge commit so uh, this commit here is um, uh, is making it not be a tree because you are merging leaves and that's not allowed so this makes uh, uh, yeah uh, get uh, an a graph of trees not a tree of trees after that I'll move into the cherry pick which I talked about it before but I didn't actually explain how how that how it beha behaved and just referenced it uh, git cherry pick will effectively uh, get all the the diff between the commit you're trying to pull and the previous one and just apply try to apply that that diff on the branch you are into on the commit you are right now on your working directory if that works 
and there's no merge conflict, you are good to go, the commit is created, the committer is uh, updated, the author is not, the merge, uh, sorry, the, the commit me message will be kept the same, so all, uh, all that changes is the, well, the parent, because now the parent is a different one, and uh, the committer. So it's that case. We have this commit here, and we want to pull it here. So, bam, it's pulled. It didn't have any merge conflict. By the way, I forgot to mention, uh, in the index file I was talking about before, the one with no uh, reliable documentation on what the structure is, whenever you have a git conflict, when you merge, you rebase, or you cherry pick, uh, a flag is added there to, so that Git knows you are in a merge conflict right now. That's one of the thousands of things uh, Git does with the index. After that, we will move to another interesting com uh, command and uh, one related to, the, to merge, kinda, and it's the rebase. And sometimes there's a confusion on when to use a rebase, when to use a merge. Uh, I think that boils down in the end to your own preference, your own choice, and the choices of your company, and how much traceability you want to get, and lots of things. But what it effectively does, what, what the behavior is, so that you can relate to that after this, is basically it starts the same as a merge. It calculates which is the most common ancestor. In this case, it's this one. And then when you try to rebase this branch,